Welcome to uh, what I expect to be an amazing conversation, really a, a thought-provoking conversation on building resilient healthcare systems. Uh, we are live streaming this session. I want to introduce very, very quickly my guests, uh, the panelists tonight, uh, today, but you'll also have their full bios in your, uh, in your WEF materials. Kenji uh, C is uh, the CEO and founder of Fortinet, a $3 billion $3 billion uh, cybersecurity firm, and he is a serial entrepreneur who started his first company, I think, in 1993. Uh, Dr. Ann Firth is uh, not only the dean, but also a professor at the Yale School of Nursing and also a professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. Uh, Michael Niedorf is the chairman and CEO of Centene, a global 500, a Fortune Global 500 health insurer um, that last year had something like $60 billion and now is on pace for $100 billion in revenue, which is, makes it quite, quite, quite large. And Dr. Jay Ayer is the executive director of Access to Medicines, a Netherlands-based uh, organization that is hoping to bring access through pharmaceutical company engagement uh, to uh, much of the world that doesn't have it. So that's our group here today, and we're going to kick off. Jay, let me start with you because... You know, we do think about building resilient healthcare systems. We often think about access to medicines, which is what you fundamentally are, are, are uh, focused on. How are we doing, actually? Hey, you just have a 10-year report. So let's just get a baseline here, how we are doing compared to where we were a decade ago. So a decade ago, we had, um, I think, a lot more. Um, that was the beginning of all the awareness uh, mm. when multiple pharmaceutical companies and governments came together to say, this is something that we need to prioritize. Access to healthcare needs to be prioritized. We've had um, the uh, Astana Declaration for uh, Almaty Declaration in Astana in, um, on looking at primary healthcare. We've got uh, things like the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that have been set up where every pharmaceutical company, multiple governments have subscribed to. So the awareness is definitely there. Our report shows that, um, specifically when you're looking at the pharmaceutical industry, that progress has been made mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of uh, the response the pharmaceutical industry takes uh, in, in terms of addressing access to health care for people living in low- and middle-income countries. Um, but I think what you're starting to see is that the bulk of the activities is really borne by a small group of, of companies. And that dependence on that small group of companies is, I think, the, the biggest issue. We, we haven't solved two major problems. One is uh, sustainable access for uh, old medicines that uh, are still clinically useful. Some of them are economically not uh, um, strong anymore, so um, uh, companies are leaving the market in, uh, for some of them, like antibiotics, for example. And uh, we still don't have a pathway for uh, new innovations, for new medicines. Most of them, when they are um, made available, we can't celebrate because we have a new treatment or a new cure we have to um, stand there and, and struggle because the prices are uh, often unaffordable and access is not guaranteed for 83% of the world's population. So that was a wonderful and very diplomatic answer, it seems to me, that, you know, I mean, giving praise a little bit to the, to the industry. But where are the challenges now? I know you partner, for example, uh, or the drug companies partner with, say, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, and others, but are we building enough capacity to deliver these drugs um, in the developing world? I think the biggest challenge is all the progress that we've made uh, doesn't address the scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. You need uh, scalable solutions, you need sustainable solutions, and these are just words sometimes, and uh, we know that this is, a, this is hard for, for any organization to tackle on their own. That's why you're looking at more and more collaborative activities that are trying to address this problem. But I fear that the scale of the problem, I mean, we're talking about 83% of the world's population living in low-income countries. Right. That's big. But I always say we've managed to, as a society, as a, as a group of individuals, we've guaranteed access to medicine for 5 billion people in the world. So we only have 2 billion people who need access to medicine. So it's not an un, un impossible challenge. Michael, um, you know, there are so many issues with access to medicine, supply chain, uh, procurement issues. But one of the fundamental ones is price. The price of drugs have been just going sky high. And even if we have programs uh, for those in need, they still are too, uh, too expensive in many cases. How are you dealing with that constant escalation of price as a, as a major health insurer? I think a key issue is if we know a drug, when especially pharma, that's so expensive, if it's going to help somebody, make sure they get it. Mm -hmm. and it's dosed the right way. 
But I think what we have to do more of, and we're doing a lot of it ourselves, we have systems now that can do it, is you need to use genomics and determine will that drug help that person. There's too often now we are using a particular pharmaceutical. It's new. Let's try it, see if it works. And it's $200,000 or $100,000. And if it's going to work and it's going to cure it, it's when hep C drugs came out, you know, and it cost $70,000, that's great. If it's going to cure them, the overall cost of that patient, you could do the, the balance. Now, I'll tell you what I wasn't going to say. Yeah, please. <laughs> I think there's some things we can do, though, to bring drugs down. And one of the things, every time I turn on a television in the U.S., they're advertising a drug. And doctors don't like it. There's people coming in asking, taking time. And I have been asking, what happens if those drug, those costs for that advertising was not tax deductible? Mm. Maybe, we, maybe there'd be a nice way to start to minimize it and put those funds against the cost of the drug. But somewhere it's in the cost. I like that. It's an outside-the-box, thought-provoking solution. And, you know, one of I the... Made an uh, enemy of all pharma, but that's... Okay. Yeah, right. Well, that's okay. That's okay. And, you know, one of the um, issues that we are seeing now is that many, um, not only emergent diseases, but old infectious diseases or uh, familiar ones like measles and cholera are, are now sort of spreading in areas. In the case of measles, where we have really good vaccines to, tr to prevent this disease, we're seeing this happening in many hotspots around the world. Talk a little bit about how we can, can revitalize that, vex anti that vaccine movement. Yeah, so really it, it ties through here also with the drug availability and the precision health um, opportunities, which is you have to have patients who are engaged in their care and informed and educated. They played a role in activism in giving us HIV drugs and fast-tracking um, approvals for medications. Mm -hmm. And also then in terms of um, people understanding in this era of anti-science, frankly, mm -hmm. the importance of uh, vaccinations, um, the, 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 the facts about their, their, um, their benefit, and also the idea that, you know, we're all in this together and you can't just rely on herd immunity from everyone else getting vaccinations. So, so you're right, there's about 350 emerging and re-emerging pathogens um, that are going to be affecting every health system. And that's going to be exacerbated by climate change, which is also the other big issue uh, in front of us in, in health systems. Now, I want to come back to climate change a little bit later, but I want to talk a little bit about these hot spots because when we're talking about, um, you know, the building resilient healthcare systems, there are many places that don't have healthcare systems at all. Um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we've been all aware of the frightening Ebola epidemic there with more than 3,000 infections, more than 2,000 dead the second biggest Ebola epidemic uh, on record. Uh, but what's less sort of talked about is that in that same region, over that same period of time, there have been 18,000 malaria deaths, 500 or so cholera deaths, a massive measles outbreak. I mean, how do we even begin to address these systems? That's right. So there's these acute uh, episodes that come up that stress the health systems, uh, but then there's still the, all the ongoing care that has to happen. And one of the Time Magazine um, persons of the year a few years back was a, a, a nurse who uh, got Ebola, survived it, mm -hmm. and then died because when she was pregnant and was seizing, no one would touch her. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, being able to educate, um, again, um, and working with communities to be resilient, the places that have done well with Ebola was where the community trusted the health system and, and you could leverage um, uh, things to change like uh, funeral practices that would reduce transmission. So uh, it, it does still come back to um, trust, education, engagement, but also resources, mm -hmm. um, re realistically. May, may I add, I'm sorry. For that. Please. I just want to add something. I think if we talk about Africa, we're, so if we could just go back to fundamentals and ensure that Africa had clean, pure water and electricity, we could change the face of that continent. Very quickly. And health workers. And health workers, yes. Uh, the, 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 the greatest efficiencies in, in the health workforce, of course, are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so being, and nurses and midwives are actually the foundation of every health system everywhere. So being able to empower um, and engage uh, every cadre uh, to work together, but particularly nurses and midwives, and that's certainly needed the health, health workforce capacity building. 
So Ken, I want to thank the organizers for putting a technologist on this panel because it's rare that you get a, a conversation like this uh, and, and bring in someone who really understands the technology and the vulnerabilities that are happening here. Talk a little bit about, you know, outside of the box that we're so used to thinking about healthcare, where the vulnerabilities are and what you might do to immediately sort of address that. Yeah, thank you, and also that's I wonder I'm the only one not come from the uh, healthcare industry in the panel, and uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, I was trained as an engineer, <coughs> computer engineer, uh, and <coughs> been in the cybersecurity space for 30 years, three company. And healthcare actually is the, the one of the biggest industry, same as a finance service, actually uh, has a lot of cybersecurity issue. Uh, because all this healthcare information, uh, once some bad guy take that information, you kind of suffer whole your lifetime. Sometimes even they take your credit card information, your bank information, and you can change the credit card, you can change the bank. But healthcare information is so critical. So that's where uh, there's a very high spending on IT and healthcare on the cybersecurity. Uh, also going forward, there's a lot of other technology, whether AI, the 5G, uh, and also healthcare is very interesting. They have a lot of IoT device. Uh, so that's probably the, the most popular IoT device, I think, is uh, involved in the healthcare system there, which has a lot of a security issue because once you connect all these devices together, they do collect a lot of data. And most of this data really has very difficult to secure it because the device itself, the networking itself, uh, create a lot of uh, uh, issue there. So that's where how to secure the data, how to secure all the patient information in the healthcare system is not always uh, the, the biggest topic. You know, it's interesting, you know, when you're talking, I was thinking about these are developed world problems in the healthcare system, but Jay, you know, there are so many issues that, 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 that cross the boundary between developed and, and developing world. One of those is drug shortages, where we're seeing that in developed countries. In Europe, for example, there was a, a WHO report, a World Health Organization report that said that 20 plus percent of European hospitals have daily drug shortages. 45% have weekly drug shortages. We've seen that with, with cancer medic medicines, particularly things like methotrexate, which treat, uh, which treat childhood cancers as well as other things. You know, you, we're seeing these problems cascade through the system, starting in many cases in the developed world and moving to, to the developing world. Talk a, bit, a little bit about how we really start to address those. Um, so I think we, we tend to take uh, access um, for granted. Even in uh, about a couple of months ago, uh, there was a lot of discussion about being Christine, a cancer medicine mm -hmm. used for children, uh, childhood cancers. Uh, it, was, um, it, was already, it, you know, on, it was already at risk because there's very few companies that are today uh, producing being Christine. We've watched company after company leaving the, the market um, silently, so that a lot of them uh, do not produce that anymore. And what happened is um, a company like Tiva said, okay, we're going to stop production. And um, luckily, Pfizer could still uh, produce, uh, but in order for them to ramp up the production to meet the demand, uh, it would mean there would be sufficient, uh, some level of uh, lag time before uh, supplies could actually reach hospitals. So this tells you that it happens in cancer. Um, our report that we'll be launching uh, today on antimicrobial resistance tells you that in developed markets, uh, there are uh, over 30 forgotten antibiotics, antibiotics that are still clinically useful, um, often last resort antibiotics, but they are no longer produced uh, in high income markets. So what we did in our analysis, we started looking at low income uh, markets to see are the producers still able to produce, and if so, are they doing something about it? Because potentially the demand is actually higher in low income markets than there should be. Luckily, we still have some companies that are able to produce and are committed to, to produce it, but it's a slippery slope. Companies are uh, looking at, um, you know, these are, these are not green pastures. So the way to solve it is multifold. I mean, you do need companies to kind of stay in there for the, for the long run and, and stay on because you can't sell your cancer medicines if the hospitals are not safe. You can't sell your, your um, uh, medicines for transplantation if the hospitals are not safe. So you do need to make sure that common antibiotics are available. But I think governments also have an important role to play in the way we procure medicines. We tend to uh, buy medicines from the lowest uh, possible bidder instead of spreading the, that uh, over multiple um, manufacturers. UNICEF has a great plan 
uh, where they don't just buy for the, from the uh, lowest possible bidder, but they also uh, buy from multiple manufacturers. That way, preventing the concentration and the consolidation of the market. Because when you do have a problem, whether it's a, a mechanical or, or a, a technical failure of a, of a plant, you at least have um, other manufacturers who can fill up that supply. So shortages, uh, this is talking about stockouts and shortages uh, combined, I think it's, it's a serious issue. And in the US, I think you have chronic shortages of uh, several drugs. Uh, in the Netherlands, you have that. Here in Switzerland, we've uh, counted it. My team has found every single week we've gotten somewhere in the news um, in the developed world and in the developing world uh, a, a major drug shortage. Uh, some of it cannot be replaced even at the end of the year. So I think this is something which governments and companies need to come together to. You know, it's, it's, this is a conversation we've been having now for, for decades. You know, there's been a, uh, a, a fleeing away from uh, antibiotic development, vaccine development. We're seeing many of these manufacturers, they haven't been in this field for, for, for years. We're not seeing new entrants. How do we change that business model? You talk about you know, buying from higher cost producers, but, but is that enough? Do we need a different kind of a drug development? You know, maybe a, one in which, similar to weapons development, where there is a government that who's, who's a buyer for this. Michael, I mean, you're a business person. You deal with these kinds of P&L issues, profit and loss issues all the time. How, how would you recreate the... The, a drug industry for specifically developing vaccines and antimicrobials. Uh, we have a, uh, a system we're working on. And I, I really want to get away from rebates and things. I want to go to mm. net pricing. But that aside, the whole system is that a physician, if they want an antibiotic, they can go in and look at what, for respiratory, there may be four or five of them. You list them. And you put a dollar sign beside what the, the cost is. Now, we're putting doctors with more at-risk contracts, and they will, uh, th that will be charged to them, the cost of the drug. But we tell them it's no different when you buy wine. Mm -hmm. now, you say to someone, I don't want the most expensive, I don't want the cheapest, I want the value. Mm -hmm. And we have to start thinking about what pharmaceuticals we use in terms of value. What's the best drug for that particular disease state, mm. versus what's the latest and greatest? Because you know sometimes amoxicillin is still really good for a kid's sore throat. You don't need to go to the equivalent of the EPAC and the and the higher end ones. So I think what we need to do is educate and help people, help the physician community, put them more at risk, put them in control again, so that they're making the decision of what's the value, what's the best drug. This and we also have programs that use step therapy. In other words, if you want the highest end drug, that's great, but show that you've tried some of the, the others first. One last thought I was, I was reading recently the lack of development of pharmaceuticals is really become a very high risk for the population in general because you have more and more of antibiotic resistant problems in hospitals. Mm -hmm. And they're not developing the new drugs to deal with those infections. So, so how? So and I want to just talk about how we build up this armamentarium. You know, this this new arsenal of of weapons uh, to fight these new and emerging diseases. And and so part of that is the fact that we're going to have even more of them emerging. We've already seen an increase in emerging diseases, mm -hmm. but you studied now climate change and talked can talk a little bit about how that is raising <laughs> stakes dramatically in the case of ID. Yes, infectious disease, but also um, it will affect every, every disease state uh, because it will affect every health system. So j just um, pulling through the idea of uh, fundamentally when someone is writing a prescription and trying to have the patient engaged in understanding how to use it, there, is, there, are, there are pressures and, and also um, approaches that you can use to try to influence the providers. So in the United States, we have something called Choosing Wisely um, program to try to educate providers about making best use of the meds that we do have and then engaging the patients. You know, you can walk into a pediatrics office and the sign will say, don't ask us for antibiotics, right? So educating the patient about what's effective also. Um, but, but when we, we think about these existing stresses that, that we've talked about, antimicrobial resistance, supply chain disruption, now add in climate change, right? So um, this is really the existential crisis that's in front of us. 
Um, I'm actually quite always astonished at the degree to which the health sector often gets left out of planning. Mm -hmm. So certainly mitigation effects are, uh, uh, um, uh, are underway and, and you know, the health sector is anywhere from, from about 6% to 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions around the world. Just by note, we all flew here. Um, the airline industry is about 2.6% of emissions, so it's, it's considerable. So we have health systems that are they're trying to green up and really reduce their, their, uh, their carbon footprint. But the other thing we have to do is adapt the health systems, get health systems ready for the short-term and longer-term um, impacts that are coming, both from vector shifts and infectious disease um, you know, uh, changes. And now you're dealing with dengue, where you weren't dealing with that before, for example, or particulate matter. You, are you tracking air pollution so you know you're going to have an uptick in asthma cases coming into your emergency department and you're ready for that? So utilizing data systems effectively um, to really think about what's coming, including things like supply chain disruption, which, you know, we uh, IV bags were produced in Puerto Rico in the United yeah. States market, huge market, and disrupted by the, by the hurricane. So, so really anticipate, being more anticipatory, uh, because it, what I always say about the health system is it has its first responder, and it has to be the last building standing, and climate change will, and other ecosystem stresses are going to really um, uh, Put, put a lot of uh, impact on that. So you mentioned data systems, and Ken, that's that's a perfect segue to you. Uh, you know, last year I was on a panel here with Bill Gates and uh, Tedros, Dr. Tedros, the, the director of the uh, World Health Organization and others, and we specifically talked about the need for really good data to identify um, on a real-time basis what where there were infectious infections of malaria that were, you know, outbreaks of malaria or places in which there was clear resistance uh, you know, to the mosquito repellents and things like that. How are we even, are we even beginning to tackle the data problem in healthcare? Uh, I think we, we, we're doing that for the, <clears throat> probably the last uh, <clears throat> few decades already, right? So that, uh, like uh, 25 years ago, I also helped in uh, Jim Clark when he built his uh, like a uh, healthy young, then they become a web MD. They try to bring a lot of internet technology into the healthcare system there. And uh, so that's where collect the data, eventually make some good decision, including uh, some drug decision, right? So that's where, uh, so that's where the data is very, very important. And also how to protect this data also very important. And also leverage all this data, internet technology, you can also connect different part of the world together, right? So leverage whatever some, some people better train, uh, try to help in some other area, people maybe not quite well trained yet. So that's where we see the technology study all merge together. I know in Stanford, which I am also involved, they study have the medical school working with engineer school. They create all the bioengineering, some other kind of uh, interdiscipline kind of a uh, uh, study and the research together. Uh, so that's, I think, eventually will help in changing is uh, healthcare the biggest industry? And uh, mm. we see a lot of technology all starting to come in now. So you need the data, but you also need transparency. And recently there's been some criticism uh, the, about emerging uh, coronavirus in China. Um, there are other areas where um, what we saw, for example, in SARS and in um, other viruses in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, where we, we don't fully get the information fast enough from the governments, from the healthcare systems on the ground, how are we, how are we moving towards a more more transparency and more real time disclosures from these from these healthcare systems? Please, um, Jay. Yes, yeah, so I have a view. Um, so in our in our uh, work on uh, antimicrobial resistance, we, we also have invited companies to tell us what they're doing on surveillance. Um, by nature, some of the companies have to uh, understand where the pathogens are, where resistance pathogens are in geographies where they're going to register their drugs in order to find out whether their uh, potential drugs, the new drugs that they're, they're, they're launching or vaccines are going to be effective. So what we've actually uh, found is quite a few companies are open and willing to share this data. Uh, Pfizer was the only company who uh, is sharing the data, uh, the raw data, which is useful for researchers, useful also for clinical decision uh, making on, on, on where potential outbreaks could be, where uh, drug choices and treatment guidelines need to be adapted. Um, and I think this is a, a, a movement which is not linked to the, to the, in, uh, the stability or the instability of the market. This is something which every company could do if they have access to, to particular data, working with governments to make sure that uh, surveillance information is shared. Uh, I think it's, it makes a big difference, and especially with climate change uh, on the way and drug resistance growing. 
especially with shortages right in front of us, uh, this is a, a, a surefire way to get involved in this particular issue. Uh, Johnson Johnson, for example, uh, looks at uh, um, TB uh, uh, surveillance data and shares that. Um, uh, companies like Pfizer look at uh, pneumococcal diseases which affect uh, children all over the world. So um, these large-scale programs actually are quite useful, and so that's the, why data needs to be in place. So the, the, the drug companies who are on the ground can share that data quickly, even if the governments don't. And also, Anne, just to bring this back to people, um, you talked about the need for more people in the infrastructure, more healthcare workers. The effort to have community healthcare workers, um, we, we've seen tremendous success of that program in places like Liberia with Last Mile Health, uh, Raj Punjabi runs a fantastic group there. Um, there are other, other examples of this being really effective as sentinels for emerging diseases, not only giving, providing care, but also offering early warning systems. How do we, how do we reinforce that, that system? Yeah, so I appreciated your um, uh, emphasis of the use of a dynamic or real-time data. So there are a couple of thoughts there. Um, certainly, again, having a whole uh, range of health workers, including activated patients at the center, is important. So community health workers, um, the evidence base is growing about the best ways to support them. Utilizing tools like you know smartphones um, and and being able to text data in, and you can have a very a very virtuous closed loop right there in someone's um, hut out in a, in a in a rural village, right to the Ministry of Health database uh, about what uh, antiretroviral uh, regimen that person might be eligible for and then right back to the health worker who can connect them with the clinic. So we see that in places like Rwanda that are using health systems effectively. The wearables data is another question. How will health systems um, use that? But I guess I'm coming back to so certainly mining it for patterns, population patterns um, is crucial in, in terms of public health um, planning and responding to epidemics. But I'll come back to the human factor also which is um, how many of you have sat in, in a clinician room and the clinician basically has their back turned to you and they're, they're they're putting the data into the computer and they're, they're addressing the computer, right? This has actually become a barrier to sort of um, in, 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 in real time communication between the provider and the patient. And, and we're doing things like hiring scribes and trying to go with audio, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, transcription of, of data. So I, I mentioned it just as an aside because we still need that human element of, of the, the, the basis of all good healthcare is an excellent physical exam and that communication between the, the provider and the patient and then turning that, that data into um, something that makes sense for that person as well as for a population is really a, an exciting challenge. Just to put some numbers on that, so in the United States there was a jur medical journal that came out with a study that said that the amount of time that do the physician spends on his EHR, his electronic health record, has actually exceeded the amount of time for the uh, interactive visit with, with where he's examining or he or she is examining you. So we've now We've now crossed that tipping point, if you will. Uh, what we, the name of this session is Building Resilient Healthcare System. So I want to start about how can we talk a little bit about building? And so I'm giving you each a unlimited budget for now. And I want to have you talk about what you would begin to do, what you would begin to build. Um, let's start with you, Ken. What, what would you start to build first? Uh, I think if you look at the, the internet, it changed a lot about daily life, right? So, but in the healthcare system, it's the same thing. <clears throat> but even today's internet technology is still come from like a 30, 40 years ago, all the design architecture protocol. <clears throat> so they only address the connectivity and the speed. Mm -hmm. So whether the 5G or whatever, the new sd wan or internal Wi-Fi, all these kinds of things, they just kind of everything equally together. But in the healthcare system, all different data, different application, different content, different device, different user patient, you need to have a different way to handle the data. So that's because so far we're using the infrastructure which cannot differentiate any of this content or user application device. That's where security becomes biggest issue. So my biggest reason is really if you, you really design a new system, whether the 5G or the new healthcare system or kind of a lot of new device, you need to build security and networking together at the same time instead of uh, build security after that. Right? Well, I said your budget was unlimited, but I guess that's going to really be a lot to start a new 5G. And yes, what, security what? is still like a <laughs> hundred times more expensive to right. deal with the same support compared to networking because they need so much computing power, deal with so many different content data. So that's where, if you have all the budget, build it together. Right. All right, and, and you're a nurse, so I'm assuming you're more practical here. Uh, talk a little bit what you would invest in. 
Yeah, so getting health systems ready, I think, is, 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 is really um, very important. And um, when, when we think about uh, existing health systems, um, uh, adapting um, so that you are ready for those supply chain disruptions, um, you're anticipating the disease and, and extreme weather effects, you are able to inform your community, you know where your vulnerable patients are in terms of older vulnerable patients, for example, and we haven't talked about vulnerable patients' um, populations yet, um, so that you can bring them in for heating, uh, warming, and cooling. Is your hospital a cooling center? Is it also a warming center? Because we will have more extreme weather events. Um, when we think about building out the, uh, the health system, because remember, um, you know, 40% of the world lives in coastal cities. 60% of the, the cities of the future haven't even been built yet. We have an opportunity when we build new health systems, um, both hospitals and, and, and clinics, to make sure that they engage in green principles. You put your mechanic, it's, it's common sense. Put your mechanicals on the roof, not, not in the basement, right? Um, make sure that your, your IT infrastructure will be, will be um, available. Know how you're able to keep your health workers resilient because they're gonna be affected by these uh, events too. So we think about the wildfires in Australia, California, people being burned out of their homes being, being um, hurt and having to go to the hospital system. Who's staffing those hospitals? It's the same right. people who were burned out of their houses. So you have to think about mobile health care and being able to activate workforces um, in an immediate way. And some of that come back, comes back to data and some of it comes back to um, you know, sort right. of the ability to plan across systems. Michael, you have 100 billion in revenue, as I just mentioned. I've just magically eliminated your shareholders. Uh, <laughs> so go ahead and spend it for us. I don't subscribe to that, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's no one approach. I think we have to think about it in terms, and I agree with some of the things Anne's been saying, that you have your developed world where it's an educational process. We have to help people understand that things they're doing today may not affect them today, but will affect them in the future, and help them look at that. We have to help them think about anticipating, as you said. What are some of the things that could go wrong? What's your response to it? And it's going to vary from the vulnerable populations we have in this country to the more affluent. So there's a, a balance there. And then you shift to the developing world, where we've talked a lot about the need for health workers, giving them just basic fundamental tools, whether it be the iPhone or whatever, you know, the, the smartphone, I should say, that gives them the information. But I think we also need to look at the data. And there are ways to analyze it. Everybody talks about the data. There's two factors. One, who owns it? But then two, what are the analytical tools available to make it to practical or bring it to practical use? Mm -hmm. Jay, you've had more time to think about this than any of the <laughs> others. So what, what are you going to spend your money on? I'll split it four ways. Um, and uh, when you think of a health system, I think it starts off with prevention and improving vaccination uh, of, uh, of children, um, in, including t uh, teenagers for HPV. Um, I would split the next way into uh, supporting uh, community health workers, including information and education programs, uh, including uh, making sure that they uh, remain in the countries, because um, I think after some certain amount of training, the demand for them also spreads wider. Uh, the third part is access to healthcare products and services, uh, specifically looking at some of the gaps. I think if I had an, really an unlimited budget or some limits on the budget, I would look at where the specific gaps are, are women uh, underserved, are young, young people underserved, are working men underserved because they're working and they're not actually accessing healthcare uh, systems. Uh, is education a, a, a barrier? Is language literacy a barrier? So looking at the, well, some people call it the determinant, social determinants of health will be an important uh, third arm of it. And um, I guess um, to complete all of it, I would look at uh, universal health coverage, whether it truly is universal or are there particular gaps in it. Mm -hmm. um, that should be a little bit future-proof. I mean, it should also cover what would happen if, the, if pressures remain on the healthcare budgets uh, um, because of new innovation. It should be able to bring in the new innovations. You, you all talked about vulnerable populations here. You all talked about the gaps in the healthcare system and, and really those who are slipping through. Um, you know, one of the obvious groups here and an area where we're seeing, again, a, a potential for catastrophic issues are in the large refugee populations around the world. Can you talk about how we begin to be, bring beyond just the nonprofits that work in these areas into these massive tent cities or into the populations where you have a lot of internally displaced people and how we get them access to health care? 
Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. 75 million people on foot now involuntarily, the highest rate since World War II. And, you know, World Bank and WHO estimations are with climate change um, impacts that there will be hundreds of millions of people, you know, uh, in involuntarily displaced. So how are we delivering mobile health care? Um, how are we, uh, people often, especially the internally displaced folks, um, maybe moved out of their home and, and they'll be there for some period of, for a long period of time, much longer period of time. So now you're having to deliver education as well as health care across generations. Um, so th I think this is, a, this is a both a, 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 an underfunded area and one that really requires you know, cross-national um, engagement because it, the numbers are going to go up exponentially, basically, in order of magnitude from what we have now. So we've got to use all the tools available to us, policy funding as well as um, the health care uh, delivery. Yeah, I mean, we think in terms of the old healthcare system of these hospitals, which are big, you know, big buildings with legacy costs inside of them. And we're really moving more towards if everybody has a cell phone can and everybody has that ability to get a 5G connection with cyber security, um, you know, that their mobile phones will become their interface to a healthcare system. So this is something that if we're building resilient healthcare systems, should we start with that mobile phone? Yeah, mobile phone, uh, but it's uh, also going forward, they call the immersive technology. That may replace your mobile phone. So anything wearable, whatever. So you may not carry a phone five to 10 years later because everything you have is all kind of connected and give you all the data you need it, right? So that's also can, can solve all this kind of a, uh, like underserved community there and uh, with all this remote diagnostic and with all this technology sharing, and that's also eventually can solve a lot of this issue. Are you, Michael, are you moving a lot of the people that you cover into these sort of mobile type of relationships with healthcare providers? This, um, we're just ensuring that there's access. Where there is none, we'll build a clinic, we'll do some of that nature. Yeah. But coming back to your fundamental question, and we heard it before, if you have these camps, start off with making sure everybody that comes to the camp is inoculated mm -hmm. so that you can start to minimize some of those transferable diseases. Two, take a community approach to health care. Mm -hmm. Start to educate leaders within, and every, organization, every camp has some kind of informal leadership. Start to educate them on what's necessary. If you can start to do that, that's important. Mm -hmm. And the final thing is, think about what Genomics is going to mean, and I'm a big fan of it. I don't think hospitals, you mentioned legacy, are not going to look like they do today. Mm. Most things are going to be outpatient. Most are going to map the genome. The church allows all the embryonic cells and things so that you'll be able to mix up a concoction, inject it, and be curative. Mm. And so I think start looking at that and say, how do we use that in these, in these communities, make it available, because it becomes curative, and avoids the transmission of diseases. Mm -hmm. That becomes the key in my mind. It still comes back to yeah. workforce, though. I mean, so you can have all the personalized omics in the world. Who's going to do the counseling to interpret your sequence? And well, what it means I agree. You, that's, right? that's part of the community. And it's not going to be genetic counselors alone. They're, they're a small subset of every, yes. every health workforce. Yes. So we certainly yeah. need to do the sort of provider um, yes. education exactly. as well as, as expanding. Hey, you, just education. You mentioned this before, and you mentioned it, Michael and Jay, this sort of anti-science view, the fear of vaccines, this sort of... Uh, sort of radical anti-vaccine uh, rhetoric that you st sometimes see. Um, in fact, we just, uh, Fortune did a fantastic story on uh, Sanofi's ex uh, effort to uh, develop a dengue vaccine and the uh, uh, sort of huge blowback that came back from communities um, who were, who were uh, testing this in very heavy de dengue uh, infected areas. Um, but all of this kind of starts with education. When we're talking about building a resilient healthcare system, we're talking about really educating people about the need for healthcare, for basic vaccines. Yeah, it starts with that. Does that yeah. mean it starts with people understanding their responsibility. Yeah. And then uh, we also need to focus, as I said, on the community because it becomes a community event mm -hmm. where one starts to help the other. And even in camps and places like that, that informal structure to make a big difference. Jay, talk yeah. about that. I mean, so I, 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 I want to echo this point. I think the point of, of um, enforcing uh, healthcare and, and the benefits of healthcare, especially to unseen enemies, right? Uh, vaccination is all about preventing the unseen enemy from, from, right. uh, 
from getting to you. Um, antibiotics, I think, is also something which, which, which we, 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 we take for granted because we, we think that we're going to live forever. We're all super people. Um, but I think the, wait, the wait, point wait, wait, of community... We're not going to live forever? All right. We're not going to live forever. All right. <laughs> No, no, okay. no, but I think one of the main things that you realize with, um, with healthcare is that you need to build that sense of trust. And that's the biggest uh, drawback with the work that we do. You know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is just not trusted by the community. So when the pharmaceutical industry brings out a new, uh, a new product, whether it's a vaccine or, or, or medicine, people hesitate to take it on board. And it is the role of governments to definitely try to educate more and more people into why this is okay, but then you also need governments to be, to be trusted. And that's also waning down. So I go back to the point on the grassroots, the community is where you, you get the, the, that's where you build trust, mm -hmm. trust in the healthcare, trust in healthcare products. And when they work, then people take them. So, you know, this is so interesting because, you know, the healthcare, health workers used to be among the most trusted people on the planet and the institutions, the healthcare institutions were incredibly trusted. And when you look at, at, at survey data, they've, they've dropped down quite a lot. What did you people do? <laughs> well, I will counter that by saying that nurses tend to re be no, most trusted. <laughs> Depends. But actually, let me give you an example of what we're doing with that. So in the United, in the United States, um, uh, there are about uh, 600 different candidate schools trying to teach different kinds of people to go out and, and run for office. We're going to do the first nurses candidate school because, again, trusted profession, right. um, 4 million in the United States, 2% of the voting population. I don't care you know, if you're right wing, left wing, centrist. Um, just run for something locally and get engaged in policy making and leverage whatever trust that you do have with you know it towards um, be better health policy. Well, I'm on the record, and you have my vote if you run. <laughs> Jay, Jay, what can we do to sort of rebuild trust here, and what's and what's causing the sort of lack of trust? My question right, right now: Would being in politics help build trust? I mean, I think there's a lot of distrust of us. There is, we have to, but we have to invert so, I mean, that. that's. So this, that's a very good question. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, policy affects your life every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Right. That starts in a simple way. I mean, um, even in the place of AMR, I mean, do you really need to promote your, your antibiotics? Do you really need to spend all the money on, on marketing that, that then puts, puts back the pressure on price on, on health systems? I think it starts simple. Those things are not... Uh, uh, not rocket science. Uh, trust also comes in the fact that stop doing all the bad things that, uh, that uh, your, uh, any industry or any government is, is known to be. And really fight corruption, fight that, fight that urge to also deal with bribery and, and uh, uh, unethical areas. But bringing back that human-to-human -human interaction, I mean, as I, you know, I'm coming back to my favorite subject, which is community health workers. I really think this is the answer in many cases uh, because you're building those human interfaces and those deeply trusted connections in villages, in communities around the world. Um, 30 seconds for each of you. Um, what, so sort of talk about how you would rebuild the trust. Ken, how would you start by rebuilding trust in this? I think share the data and also leverage technology and uh, do the training education. Uh, that's how we'll help a lot. Great. Yeah. Leverage the trust of, of health workers like community health workers, near peers and others um, who are connected to their communities. But remember that they have to, if they're identifying a problem, they have to refer that person to a functioning health system. So you have to also have a functioning health system. I think it's just a patient interface. Mm -hmm. You have to be very patient when you talk to the person. Take the time to help them understand what the issues are and what you're doing about it. And instead of the rapid, uh, what's the algorithm and that type of thing, you can start to rebuild a lot of trust quickly. Jay? Uh, it comes down to um, making sure that the community health workers are also from the community itself. And some of them need to be potentially reskilled and educated, but they're members of the community. They have people trust each other more than, than they would trust uh, foreigners <laughs> like, uh, like ourselves or, or, or industries and, and governments in that sense. So I think it comes right down to, to hire from the community, get the community, get involved in that whole process. So speaking of drawing from the community, we actually have Desi Dimitrova uh, from the World Economic Forum to sort of say a few wrap-up comments here. Thank you, Cliffing, and thank you to this uh, distinguished panel for kicking us off this week in such a diverse way of uh, setting the foundation of what a resilient health system is, and thank you to the audience for coming today. Uh, one common thread that I see among uh, what we spoke about, we talked a lot about what we would invest in, and everybody is saying about a different aspect that they would invest in, and actually we'll never be done investing uh, because the building of resilience is not something that we ever finish a job that we tick the box and we say now let's move on to the next thing. 
Uh, it is an iterative process. It reminds me a bit of uh, actually living in a house. Uh, we have a system that, we, that already <coughs> exists. Maybe it's not perfect, we trust. We go inside and we start living, but then there is something, a disaster that comes in and we uh, make and fortify the walls a bit more. And we're never finished, but we trust that, um, that we have created the foundation which we heard is primary care, it's uh, good financing, universal health coverage, uh, good health workers, data. Uh, being ready for all the being ready for all the disasters that might come that we might not know but uh, we would anticipate, and looking at the gaps, uh, and that's exactly what we do at the World Economic Forum. We try to anticipate to understand what are the gaps, and then uh, when we identify one, uh, see who are the stakeholders that can actually address it. Uh, one example that. Um, we worked on recently in the aftermath of Ebola was uh, how can we um, how can we address uh, uh, health security threats and uh, with many of you here that I see today we launched the coalition for epidemic readiness and innovation uh, in the area of uh, financial resilience uh, we're looking at uh, what are the value-based healthcare models that can make uh, access uh, greater for more populations? We're looking at social determinants of health, precision medicine, uh, mental health, and this is going to be the program uh, for us throughout the week. We look forward to seeing many of you there and continuing the discussions and then the coalitions and the actions that we can take together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.